Hello, and welcome to this very late edition of Flick by Flick, uh, starring me, Olga Luddy. And me, Joe Kelly. Uh, it's currently about 11 o'clock, but it's, now it's 11 time. p.m.? 11, yeah. <laughs> yes, Whoa. yeah. We're, we're late, boys. Um, yeah, I, I feel like this episode needs some context, so me and Oliver have had a very long, tiring day. We're both feeling a little crazy, a little tired, but we're going to do this commentary anyway. For you, we thought... We, there's no other time for us to inform you about these three life-changing films. There's so. no time like the present exactly, for yeah. some film reviews. So, let's crack on. So, our current slate of films to review tonight are Under the Silver Lake, directed by David Robert Mitchell, Us, directed by Jordan Peele, and Dumbo, directed by Tim Burton. Whoop! Well, maybe ten years ago. But, um, <laughs> oh, yeah. no! Oh, you gave the game stink. away. Um, should we just crack on and just go straight into Under the Silver Lake? Did you have I was a... actually going to ask, oh, ask you, you a little question. question. We've already had a little opening. You know, yeah, you, one, of my little, opening. one of my little yeah, quizzes. Yeah, yeah, on, we yeah. love them. I do. Well, have, yeah, yeah. I, I noticed a little pattern between two of our three films, um, which is that Under the Silver Lake and Us are both sophomore efforts by directors. Do you know what I mean by I this? I do. I do. <laughs> I, I kept... You've, you've informed me, you warned me that you were going to do this, and I kept thinking, there's something I've forgotten for this review, and I think this is it. It's quite fun that, you know, you can just, you know, be be here, I'll say a few, <laughs> you say if you like me. Basically, uh, we're going to talk about a few, we we'll just mention a few sophomore efforts, a few of our favourite sophomore efforts from the past. Um, def- you didn't give the definition, did you? No, I so, didn't. So a sophomore film... It's the second directorial effort by a director. Yes. So, um, so it's David uh, Under the Silver Lake is obviously David Robert Mitchell's second film after It Follows, which we studied mm. together. That's the foundation of our friendship. It a lot. Yeah. And Jordan Peele obviously did Get Out before he did Us. So which we also enjoyed. Off the top of your head, can you think of any soph- sophomore films that you like? Uh, Beetlejuice. Unfortunately, I'm going to go into my sort of main directors that I know. Um, that is unfortunate. Yeah, it is unfortunate. Uh, Beetlejuice, I think, is a really good one um, because that film pretty much sums up Tim Burton to a T and it still holds up really well. And it's a kind of amazing. His acceleration of a director, I don't know. Well, now it's actually quite common, isn't it, for a director to do a very small scale film and then suddenly get rocketed into Hollywood? Yeah, ben, it's, it's, it's happening. Of, yeah, it? yeah. I think definitely for him. But I think it, it, it's kind of different though because Tim Burton feels completely like he he's in control of Beetlejuice. That feels oh, like yeah. A, yeah. a Tim Burton it film. It doesn't feel like a studio film. Modern, yeah, yeah. Modern directors, it's more like they make an indie hit and then they get kind of catapulted into the studio system. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. Um, is Aliens a sophomore film? I think I heard it. I think be. Terminator. Or is it Terminator? Yeah, Terminator's the sophomore film because um, I think James Cameron made Piranha something. Oh, oh, he made yeah, like yeah. Piranha it Two or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I yeah, I got Terminator down. I mean, t- yeah, Terminator for me. It's amazing actually how many classic films are sophomore efforts from kind of the bigger like some of the biggest directors working today yeah. it's like Memento by Christopher Nolan mm. that's one um, Pulp Fiction I think is the most obvious one um, Shaun of the Dead is technically a, a sophomore film by really? Edgar White he well he'd only done television before mm. but then he made some film in the 90s which I think was like a spoof western yeah. um, Jaws is arguably a sophomore film if you're not counting Jewel but I think yeah. he you do count Jewel, mm. don't you? Would you say um, I'm trying to remember George Lucas's filmography? Was um, was American Graffiti a sophomore film? I didn't that, look that's him one up. Of those debatable ones, isn't it? Because I, it depends. I can't remember if the original THX 1138 was a short film or a feature. I think it was a short. So. I don't know. I'm not well informed enough to say I that didn't, one. I didn't look up I, I would say that his early career is interesting enough that probably his sophomore film was... Yeah, I reckon quite, it would have been good. Yeah. I reckon all them lot. The, what yeah. are they called? The the the, 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 the film... Um, Martin Scorsese, Brian De Palma. The Brats, wasn't it? The Brats, yeah. yeah. I think you're right. The Brat Pack. 
Yes, yes, I think that's what they were called. Or is that the is that the teen comedy guys from the eighties? Am I getting this mixed up? These are some niche references. I don't know. <laughs> you know, you know, like um, like the, the Judd Nelson and like Molly Ringwald were all part of like. A, oh, d- yeah. Is that the Brat no, Pack? No, they're the Brat Pack. The yeah. Brat Pack is Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and <laughs> Sammy Davis Jr. So what's? The, I don't know what they're called. The film Brat s- Snobs or something. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I I actually think I I got a, a favorite which is Shame by Steve McQueen. Mm. And you haven't seen that, have you? No, I haven't. That's fantastic. Uh, he so he made Steve McQueen made Hunger with Michael Fassbender. Then he teamed right. up with Michael Fassbender again um, to make this drama called Shame about sex addiction. Um, you need to watch that. That's really really yeah, stunning. It has like an amazing it. soundtrack. Yeah. That's um, I've only seen it once, and it's remained like I'd say in my like top fifteen films. Yeah, it's yeah, fantastic. There's also like I I think I'm excited for a lot of sophomore films coming up. There's been some incredible directional debuts in the in the last couple of years. Yeah, like uh, Julia DeCano, Greta well, Gerwig. Like we say, we were very excited for Under the Silver Lake and Us, weren't we? Um, we sure were. <laughs> <laughs> we were. We will, uh, yeah, go into each in detail. Should we? Should we jump straight into Under the Silver Lake then? I um, think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Under the Silver Lake, basically, almost like a neo noir film, uh, directed by Dave um, David Robert Mitchell. He wrote it as well. Yeah. 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 Um, starring Andrew Garfield. Basically, Andrew Garfield plays a sort of down on his luck sort of. I would say slob, but he's almost too good looking to be a slob. But he, he lives well, a very he slobby is like, lifestyle. Yeah, slobby he? loser. Very he's um, perverted. A bit of a stoner as yeah, well. Yeah, a bit leery. Yeah. Um, but he starts to discover all these hidden messages in advertising and mainstream media, and he soon finds himself, uh, you know, initially sort of going after the femme fatale. He finds himself in a web of deceit and corruption. And if that sounds like it's a very generic setup, it's probably because it actually is. Oh, um, well, I, I guess it's important to say what kind of kicks it off is is more like this sort of noirish mystery. So he he gets the hots for, for one of his yeah. yeah he gets the hots for one of his neighbours, spends a very short amount of time with her, and then she disappears, and he comes across all these other characters, and that's when he starts making all these strange discoveries in very LA's strange. underbelly. Yeah. So, yeah, what did you think of Under the Silver Lake? Uh, I was really, I, I, well, not only disappointed, but angry, because, well, like we said, we really liked um, uh, It Follows, because mm. it felt like a very fresh horror film. It felt like one that, even though, the, well, it, it felt like a very for, well-thought-out perspective. It didn't feel like there were any gaps in logic too much. It felt very emotionally in tune with its characters. It Absolutely. Feel like a, a, a skewed world view. Whereas this film, I know you had a different experience where you said that like, you preferred, you were kind of still going along with the first half hour and it just got worse for you. Mm, for me, I would say that I was watching the first half hour kind of in disbelief because like I said, there's a leery quality to, and I say quality in quotation marks, to Andrew Garfield's uh, character, but it's not done in a self-aware way. The women are portrayed very, very much at a distance in this film. There's a very sort of... I, I know that you can say that part of the noir setup is that, it, you know, the sort of element of the other, but in this film... It, it it's feels also too much of a very divide. Yeah, yeah. Gaze. Um, mm. to, to be fair, just to, well, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll quickly say, I I do think that the the uh, film and maybe this is just what I'm taking from David Robert Mitchell having taken it follows, which I think is a film that's incredibly aware of sexual politics yeah. and the history of objectifying yeah. objectifying in films, objectifying in the genre. Um, I do think Under the Silver Lake is self-aware, but I, I think that's kind of not an excuse, uh, and, and it's, al- it's almost worse, it's kind of, um, I don't know. there I mean, isn't any interesting, yeah. I, I, I felt watching it like it was trying to kind of deconstruct this idea of the male gaze, but it, I don't think it was doing it in any kind of meaningful or interesting way, I thought they just 
seems I to be like... I think that's what I mean by self-aware is that it was it, it was almost pseudo-intellectual, but it wasn't aware of what it was doing. Mm. Like it, it was kind of putting across all this content. And yet it's not aware that it's just doing it in a completely superficial and thoughtless manner. Um, but I mean, it, it's it's a bizarre film because it, it has kind of the same visual tone to It Follows where it's grounded in sort of suburban um, America. Lots of sort of wide shots, kind of a oily sort of coloration. Yeah, and there's a lot of kind of sitting um, in sort of leaf ridden gardens yeah. with like dirty swimming yeah, pools and, and stuff like that with mucky apartments um, and it just doesn't there are so many elements of the film that feel disconnected it's almost like the, the, uh, the score as well the score feels like it could actually be a good score for a, a the, the score in, yeah. the, in of itself it's d- done by I think they're called Disaster piece. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And the same guys that did it follows. It follows yeah. Um, and the, the score one one on its own. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, it works quite well. It's like but a classical noir, but you can't marry that. No correlation like, between it. Yeah, and what's going because on? Visually, really. it's not removed. They're, they're going for like a, a thematic tone of this recreation of a noir mystery in modern day. And yet, visually, there's no like stylization to separate it from our reality. If that makes sense, yes, it I feels like it's taking place in our reality, and yet there's this odd feeling to it, and it just does not. It never connects. Mm. Um, there's not that, and it's the same with the score. You've got this like classical score playing that you feel like would be great if it was m- matched to like what was visually of a. a a sort of loving homage to mystery films. Mm. But it's not. It's like a. It's, it's it's like something you and I would film if we were out in Los Angeles for the weekend. You know. Oh, hopefully we. Can <laughs> we film it. Oh, I mean, you know, no. it's, it's, it's pretty good. That was arrogant. Um, um, yeah, I, I think kind of the the overarching problem for me is I. I you're basically with Andrew Garfield's character the entire yeah, time. Yeah. It's completely. He is your way into the film. And I thought, because I thought that the filmmakers and everyone involved was self-aware about the, yeah. the kind of person he was, mm. I was like, I don't. if they don't care about him, and if they're just looking down on him and being like, look at this loser trying to find something that doesn't really matter, then why should I care? And, and that, I felt right. that way pretty quickly. But that was my personal reading of it. I thought they were presenting this idea of the weird, slobby, lazy guy, almost like a weird keyboard warrior, but without right. like the internet, discovering all this stuff and being completely self-indulgent, being completely obsessed with sex and this idea of women from a distance. And that is a character that you could deconstruct, but like the yeah. film isn't really interested it tries in to it. Portray it just it like has him there, portrayal. and then it's him yeah. running around trying to find things that the film kind of establishes are silly yeah. and aren't going to go anywhere. That's the film. The, the, that's sorry. That's the film. That's the thing that the for, the film forces you to go along with him. It's almost like being paired up with someone in class that you don't want to work with. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's like this this guy who has like no redeeming qualities. It's like he's your pr- protagonist. Go along with him. You're in this mystery with him, mm. and it's like. I don't want to be here with this guy. Like, I, there's exactly. no character development, and it's weird because like Andrew Garfield, I think is yeah, is about as as about as likable a screen presence as I think you could ever get. Like, I, I like him in pretty much everything. I and I, I don't think he's the problem personally. I think he's it's just the material. It's just yeah, his material is, is useless, with. and yeah. it's um yeah um and and I, I want to say that. I, I, again, I think people will feel differently about this, but because I studied English language at A level, oh, wow. and it, literally, and now I write like media studies resources. Really? I write all the time about the fact that there are that everything in the media has a message, and that um, people communicate I, ideologies yeah. through the media. I don't even think that's something that you need to study no, no, to know that. Exactly. No, yeah. exactly. Like it, it's simple things, but I think. It's, if, if you kind of have any idea, if you like did GCSE English, then you know that thing. So to see <laughs> characters like realize this, again, I know well, it's no, self aware. No, no, he realizes it and no one like believes him. Yeah, but it's, 
it's like, what's the point? Yeah, yeah. Again, well, yeah, again it's I like, get this sense that like they know that that's a silly arc, but then it's like, but okay, but why do we care? It's not broadly mm. funny enough or crazy enough and for, they don't for do this anything. to be okay. Like, there's one bizarre scene where he discovers the songwriter of everything. Basically, if you didn't know this, um, it turns out that all of your favourite artists, they didn't write their, their songs. It was this one guy who looks like a Dick Tracy villain <laughs> in this apartment in Los Angeles who is somehow writing these songs to sort of control your route through life. So he says, oh, you know, you, you weren't rebelling uh, against, you know, authority. This song that I wrote forced you to. It's like, okay, well, why did you force him to... Why, you, why are you forcing us to rebel? Yeah. What, what does that mean in, like, the broader... It just puts all these sort of very, very loose ideas out there but doesn't realise them or inject enough detail for them to be interesting or to have you like think about them a bit on a lot deeper level. I, I think you sum it up perfectly. It's it's almost like a series of bumper stickers. Just <laughs> it like, is, yeah. Strung together. It it, re it really is. And and um not to mention that the path of like him discovering how things are connected is just convoluted as all hell. I mean the the bit that broke it for me, there's a character who Andrew Garfield uh, sort of meets part way through who is almost like a conspiracy theorist he has this collection of sort of materials and things where he's yeah. like all these hidden government messages are in here and he shows it to Andrew Garfield and of course this guy does it he, he kills himself doesn't he or, or I thought there's, I thought a, there's a sort of murdered. yeah yeah there's an, an implication that he was murdered um, but he leaves a cereal box with a map enclosed in it and, oh, what is it? Does So Andrew Garfield, I think he listens to a song, remember, bear in mind, I listened, watched this about a week ago. He listens to a song and gets coordinates, doesn't he? And then, or, no, he gets, this is I, how, I this is how he, stupid yeah, he, he, he it is. He deciphers like, the... He gets like a series of, he gets the letters NPM1, which turns out means Nintendo Power Magazine issue one. Somehow he discerns that and he's like, yes, that's definitely the answer. And it gives him a page number and he goes there and there's like a map from The Legend of Zelda. And somehow he also discerns that this letter and number that he's been given means that he has to draw like grid markings on it. So, mm -hmm. so almost like a map that you, where you'd have like A, B, C along one axis, one, two, three along the other. He does that on this Zelda map. He's like, what is this supposed to mean? <laughs> and then he's like, oh my God, goes to this unrelated cereal box, pulls out the map, and it turns out you put the map onto the map in the Nintendo Power magazine to find out where in Los Angeles you've got to go. <laughs> it's like, most of the film is this, just connecting bizarrely randomised pieces of pop culture material together in a way that doesn't really make much sense. And you're like, how on earth can you... And also, crucially, like, why, why does this matter? Yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> I, I, I almost imagine them making it and being like, oh, this is really jokes. Like, I, like uh, watching this guy go through this much effort and doing all this pointless stuff only to find out that actually, like, you know... He's been had all this he, time. And, and he's not, you know, he's, he's not good enough and he's wasting his time with all this stuff and no woman actually wants to be with him. And it's like, but what's the point? Like, yeah, th yeah. That's, oh, it's so, it's so annoyingly like pointless and doesn't re and isn't interested in engaging you with him the, the reason I didn't mind the f first half an hour is because I was still figuring out what the film was trying to do and because I like Andrew Garfield there are a couple of moments where where I thought that was going some way to building a character like for example I quite liked the scene where he was walking along at night and then the kids were like messing with the cars and then he like oh, right. he punched like a kid yeah. and shoved an egg in his face. And that was kind of perversely shocking and made me laugh. And I was like, shit, he's a anything? weird. No, no, no. <laughs> this is what I mean. Like, yeah. when you don't know where the rest of the film is going to go, like that scene worked in the moment. But then at the end, yeah, I was well, just I like, mean, well, none of it. We're Ties gonna, together. We're going to move on to a film that is all about setup and payoff and does it very effectively. But this one, it kind of puts stuff in that's set up and it never pays off. 
and it makes payoffs out of nothing <laughs> set up. It's like two polar opposite oh. ways of how to do it. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think yeah, in the in the end of the day, it's just um, crucially a disappointment. Yeah, it's it, it's such a shame because it's um, it it like you said, it follows. I know you you can't always make comparisons, but hey, it is the same writer and director. Yeah. Um, it follows. He had a a clear core concept, which was really f- well thought through, really well realized. But it crucially, you to think about it more. Crucially, he evolves that concept around characters that he seems to have an affection for, or who he at least thinks are interesting, and you know, who, who bear some resemblance to people in real life. And I think the crucial problem is, is we spend so much time with a guy that the film is laughing at, mm. and it's really, really unsatisfying to watch. I didn't like, even feel like he was laughing at him though. I th- did I, you not? No, I, I maybe felt that was just kind of my reading. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe, maybe, like you said, you kind of went in with a different perspective where you're like, you know, well, I mean, you went in before any of the reviews had come out, hadn't you? Uh, no, um, I, I knew it was badly reviewed. Yeah. Um, um, I'd heard disappointment, but I went in kind of blindly. But I, I, I felt like the film was kind of taking him seriously. And it's, and especially, I mean, he's, he's almost validated in the film's view of women anyway. Um, in terms of how sort of ancillary they're depicted to be, you know, they're very much just sort of See, surrounding. Figures. I think they're doing the whole. We're seeing it from his perspective, and we're seeing his warped perspective. <laughs> Is it, for me? It's Is the same. It? It's the same. It's the kind of Wolf of Wall Street thing. It, right. It's that like they're clearly aiming for excess, and they're clearly mm. aming to. Um, the filmmaking is clearly aiming to capture the misogyny right. of the central characters. The pro- I have the same problem, though, with that, and it's like, but the, the, the film has one register in which it's conveying that that yeah. um, idea, and it goes on for two and a half fucking hours. Oh, my God, we haven't even mentioned that. The film's two and a half hours long. Yeah. A film that probably should have been, like, an hour and a half. You probably could have cut quite comfortably cut this story. Oh my down god! To it, an hour and a half. it could have been a fucking short, short film. film. <laughs> it, it, it it really could have done. Um, and, and another comparison I was I was thinking is, in a weird way, there are some similarities with like the Big Lebowski in terms of it's like a, a I did guy think about that part who's about through. to be moved out of his house. He's a bit of a like a loner. All bit of this of a, doesn't really mean anything. When yeah, you yeah, but it's all about him com- me, trying to unsolve this mystery, but. You know, does he really care? Of and it's meeting all these crazy characters. But, but I, I think that's the thing. I think that film is made by the characters almost. Exactly, it's like exactly. Such colorful the characters, characters are interesting, and they have they kind of all seem serious about what they're doing. Whereas in Under the Silver Lake, it feels like they're well, I forming I've, and I've, rapid. Yeah, I mean, I I was watching it. And I was thinking this reminds me of like it's like some video games I've played where you're like walking around for a while and there's like this wide shot of you walking around and nobody talking to you <laughs> and then you find like someone to interact with and you're like can you tell me where this is and then the person like robotically answers you can go over here i heard that they're over here and you can like talk to them over here and then you just go to like most of the film was like that it's just andrew garfield like finding people and being like hey do you do you know this uh, this girl and then they'll they won't have any like like colorful response to that it's just mm-hmm. Yeah, I knew her. This person might also know who they are. And he's like, okay, thanks. And then just moves on yeah, to the next thing. Yeah, I, I agree. It's I agree. so robotic. The one thing I would say is I know that it has actually polarised people in that there are some people who really do like it. I've seen actually some high schools. Oh, yeah, yeah. I imagine high schools. Like like, it. Yeah, I am genuinely interested to hear someone Explain. give like, a positive yeah. review of yeah. it. Um Beyond just like everything we've said of and saying, but that's the point mm. because I, like I said, I don't think that's good enough, particularly in terms of the the way that um, women are represented in it. Well, I think the test of a really good film, and the, I mean, I've told you about. Um, I've mentioned this film several times. We still haven't gotten around to watching it, but um, I watched True Stories last time last year, Ooh, which is an I really want to see. By, David Burt Bird of The Talking Heads. I keep mentioning it to people because I loved it. It was one of the favourite films I saw last year. Um, but it's, you know, 1980s release. But um, that film, there's like this massive debate around it as to whether 
because he plays like this this weird drifter narrator guy like sort of cruising through American like sort of culture and like mm. excess and like mole culture of the 1980s and he's like saying how beautiful it all is like look at these warehouses look how um, incredible they are and, yeah you know, the architectural design of these warehouses these big steel warehouses and there's like this big debate as to whether like he's serious or whether he's satiring like mm. American culture I read it that he was serious and he was genuinely like positively appraising all these things but there are pe- plenty of people I respect who have said, no, he's, he's having you on. He's like, yeah. th- this complete satire. But in both of those viewpoints, you can say the film is a great film. Okay. Which is, I think, a failing of this film is that if you think it's serious, then maybe you can say it's great. If you don't, you're like, no, it just falls apart. It's, it's no mm, good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe I mean, that's a good comparison, actually. Um, but mm, I, I, I think... <laughs> I think I felt trolled for two and a half hours. <laughs> I really did. Yeah. I I, I thought it was taking... maybe, like you say, maybe he's a keyboard maybe David, David Robert Mitchell's a keyboard warrior and he's uh, written the script in his basement just I th- to troll you. I thought it was an insightful Facebook comment <laughs> dragged out into two and a half hours. It's one of those insightful That's comments on the genuine. internet where it starts out kind of like you're like, Okay, there could be a point here. And then, sort of, in the final sentence, they suddenly completely turn it around. You're like, "Yeah, this is really stupid." <laughs> <laughs> um, should we um, move on to f- 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 yeah, <laughs> brighter, brighter plays? Brighter plays. Again, we always have to. So we always, I, we seem to always start these things with um, films we hate, and we, we want to establish we don't actually hate films. We yeah. actually kind of like them. Um, we don't want to come across as moody old critics. It just so happens we're that we're so old and we'll, so we'll talk. Uh, I mean, after we've done these three films, maybe we can talk about some films that we have seen separately and enjoyed this month. If I can oh, remember. that would be really nice. I, 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 my my memory's like Swiss cheese nowadays, so I um, don't know if I can do that, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, let's talk about uh, uh, us. Do you want to introduce it, Mr. Um, Extraordinary? I'll do my best. So it's the second film by Jordan Peele. Obviously, he made Get Out, and it is about a family uh, who go to sort of a beach house to they stay. They have a getaway, don't they? Yeah. They're going for a family Where is getaway. it set again? My San... San um, Flavara Hasraska. Uh, send something around. The location doesn't really matter. Um, well, it's very much that like typical American. What's the, what's the term for the um, for the American sort of mountain area? I can't remember. Um, it's it's <laughs> like this. It's very much typical holiday in the American countryside. They they have like a, a holiday home on a lake in the middle of the woods. Yes, they with a beach the, nearby. Yeah, they go yeah. to like a beach with a classical carnival on it, a fun fair, if you will. It's like an American um, version of um, Blackpool. Uh, yeah, you could say I that. Don't know. Blackpool's that was, evolved, that evolved since then. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about that on <laughs> on ride by ride, but. Um, <laughs> Um, our theme park show <laughs> um, yeah but no yeah yeah very much us. Super, yeah. so Us is about a family it's uh, Lupita Nyong'o and uh, her husband Winston Duke um, they've got a daughter and a son and they go to this holiday home uh, but we've had a flashback at the beginning in which Lupita Nyong'o as a little girl has like walked off by herself she on the went same to the beach. same fair um, when she was younger and walked off on her own got lost in like a hall of mirrors not well yeah it was a hall of mirrors yeah um and saw what she thought was a girl who looked very much like herself and we see these flashbacks where it said it shows that she wasn't talking to her parents about it afterwards for ages and sort of it clearly had this major effect and now that the family are going back there as a family unit she hasn't told her husband and she's getting very fretful about the fact that yeah they're going not only going back there but there a lot of coincidences are starting to A happen. lot of things are starting to trigger her kind of anxiety and trigger um, memories of that mm-hmm. night. Yeah. And basically it culminates, this is sort of the, the setup, it culminates in them being at the house and then a family that look very much like them show up on their driveway yes. and they are less than friendly. 
Um, just to warn, we probably will go into spoilers yeah, me during this. But um, I love but how we didn't warn people about <laughs> Under the Silver Lake. <laughs> Nobody's gonna no one's going to watch it. Two and a half hours? Yeah, give me a break. Um, Bollocks. I will put a time code on the screen now. Oliver, you yeah. put the time code there. Yeah, yeah that's it, that's it. Um, Stop skip, talking to your skip future to self. <laughs> he, he enjoys it, don't it's you? cheesy! Um, yeah, skip to that time code to avoid spoilers. But... What did you think of us? <laughs> well, I really enjoyed it. I, I, the first thing I would say about it is that, again, marks of good films. I, one of my favourite things, we talked about a little bit about this on the Batman commentary, about different people's interpretations of one film. And I could kind of see going into this what the general perception of what this film was about. There's a lot of people talk about it being about class, mm -hmm. where, okay, we're in spoiler territory now, there is a basically an underground society of the tethered who are basically in identical duplicates of us mm. um, who act out they, they act sort of act out our actions don't they yeah they they, they kind of do like budget quality. versions of everything <laughs> budget no 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 they, it's, yeah. it's true that they, they do they do yeah. it without all the kind of resources yeah. we have and all the sort yeah, of yeah I shouldn't laugh about that because that is part why of why are you laughing at no. class inequality um, but that's the thing yeah the, that is generally the sort of reading of this but I really enjoyed it because my reading of it was more about sort of like childhood trauma and mm. how that affects us individually, how that changes us as people, and how that contributes to a feeling of a society, of a whole society. Mm. So like, you know, when she is, when she does see that other version of herself, there's that element of like, when something traumatic happens to you when you're a child, that sort of trade-off, like where there's a change, that this has affected you in some way, that oh. you almost get set onto a different track and become someone else. Um, that's, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's why I really enjoyed this film. And, uh, you know, the ending um, links into that because it turns out in the end that they're basically they swap places on that night. Yes. So the real her went to the un was trapped in the underground society, whereas this um, alternate version became... Set she sort place. of... Um placed herself yeah. into her life. I mean, that's it was a twist, and this is another, again, all these things that this movie shows, a good film. It's a twist that I saw coming right from when they first showed the beginning, but it's one that made me think about it, because then it's sort of like, well, they've swapped places, but she has become the person that she is now. Mm. Do we really say that's not her? Because it's... It's her, yeah, you know. It's like yeah, yeah, absolutely. that's a debate of who she is. It's, it, it, who is it's from such a young age, isn't yeah, it? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, that, that, that kind of nature or nurture question yeah. of, of yeah, what sets mm. what sets people exactly the they yeah. go down. And even when um, the two families meet in the initial uh, sort of the, the the moment that sort of splits them apart and really challenges them when the the, the tethered family captures the real family and sort of. Um, each of them one by one is set upon their their counterpart yes um, even then it's it's sort of based upon like you know like fundamental characteristics of each of these characters like the girl who's who's being sort of encouraged to oh yeah she's do, like, encouraged track to running. do track sports and of course you know? the, she's told to run and then her counterpart runs after her is almost something like this is some some sort of internal fear that she's been confronted with, and how she's going to react. Oh, to it. absolutely! And like, and like the dad, where he's trying to, he's basically trying to protect his family, and yet this Teb counterpart is just also. The shit out if of you him. look at it that way, there's something kind of arguably funny about the, the, the dad's conflict because most of the conflict takes place on his boat, which yeah, he feels yeah. weirdly protective yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's 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 a very good way of looking. I I will be completely honest. Um, I um, it's probably not a good thing for me reviewing the film to admit, but I took it on in on, on a very very sort of superficial level because I think it's just so damn enjoyable. Mm. Um, mm. I, I was really really just going along with the the performances. I didn't know where it was going to go yet. The way it was shot. Um, Thematically, I kind of went with just the, the, the more obvious, like, the class, class thing. thing. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, you know, the, the idea of 
the certain things were handed at birth and you know, where that can lead you. Yeah. And you know, people ignoring yeah, uh, like, a, a hidden problem. People yeah. who probably share a lot in common with yeah. them, living beneath the surface in like mm. unbelievable sort of poverty. But um, there, there's so much, e even if you don't want to look into the film with um, like that much sort of thematic depth, yeah. there's so much to enjoy. Yeah, yeah um, I said that to a friend who was like, oh, I didn't really enjoy Get Out because it had it was a bit heavy on the social content. Us, I think, is more accessible in sort of a mainstream regard. Um, um, yes, yes, I, I, I go with that. I, I think that is one of the reasons why. Um, see, I, I absolutely loved Get Out, but I think I prefer this. Yeah, same. I, I think I like this. I, I would need to um, watch Get Out to say which is the better film, but I prefer us. The, yeah, the, the thing is, I think f f for two reasons, because um, because <laughs> we love Get Out. <laughs> um, the fir the first reason I think is that because Get Out is very Get Out is very clearly an allegory to do with race. Yeah. It, it's it's quite um, upfront about that. The whole premise is so clearly oh, yeah. tethered towards yeah. race. That's not a problem because it does a I think a very intelligent thing where it's more about that sort of liberal patronising racism, which is very yeah. relevant now. Um, us though, like you just proved, can be interpreted in a whole host of different ways yeah. and I think it's a the horror genre is a great place to kind of well any genre really to have a story which can be interpreted in a number of yeah. ways and can mean different things for different people um, the, also just on a level of like how scary a film is I prefer us because I think Get Out um, is actually it's such a perfect concise script everything can get out that is Set up. Have you watched it since the cinema? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've watched it about four or five times, oh, right. yeah. um, and um, it, it it just so perfect. I was really really happy when it won best original screenplay at the Oscars. Mm. I think it yeah. was completely well deserved. The only thing is, I think uh, as a kind of horror fan, um, because it was so, so yeah, mm, yeah, because it was so like neatly compact, and I felt so kind of safely in Jordan Peele's hands almost. It there was like. It was lacking a slight sense of like immediacy for me, and I think there was more a sense in us that kind of anything could happen, well, yeah. and that it could spiral out of control. And I think I preferred that. Yeah, a bit more. I mean the the real. I think what really worked about us is sort of set up and execution was that there's that time given at the beginning to connect to them as a family unit. There's such a well uh, depicted family unit. You see how each of them interact with each other, how they bounce off of each other. Um, I think almost the only flaw that I had with it was that when they are individually challenged and split off, you almost don't feel like you're attached to in any of them individually enough to be as invested. And then suddenly when, when they come back together again as a family, you're like, yes, we're back into it because they work so well as one group. I, I agree with I, you. I, 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 wouldn't say, say, I wouldn't say the problem is that you're not invested in them as individuals. I'd say the problem is it's a, like the dynamic is stronger when they're together. Yeah. Yeah. And be it, 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 that section of the film when they do split off is just slightly more conventional than yeah. the rest of it. Yeah. I mean, that, I'd say that's the problem. Because I, I, I immediately, like about five minutes in, I said to myself, because, uh, you know, obviously it's a horror film and I knew it was like a high rate. I was like, Surely he can't kill any of this family. <laughs> yeah, like they're, yeah. they're all too likable. Like yeah, yeah. I, I'd be so upset if but like you say, it's, it's, it's they're putting pretty dire peril. Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You're, absolutely. You're equ it, at the, on on one level, you are saying, I hope this doesn't kill any of them. Surely he can't kill any of them. But then you're also thinking he could kill any of them. At yeah, any yeah. Time. Right. It, it it establishes that. Um, unpredictability which is very very how, it, uh, how it's uh, executed there's, there's also some great moments um it, it was one of the, f the few films actually where um you usually in well in a lot of horror films they kind of establish characters at the beginning because they sort of need to yeah like any film does and then the peril enters like whatever's trying to kill them or whatever the threat is enters and then all that kind of goes out the window and it's all about survival and I thought this was one of the few films where once the peril enters, they all become more interesting. Yeah. Um, and it's all done through little mannerisms and little gestures. And Again, how they react to these um, versions of themselves. I'm a sucker for moments like this, but the the, the, the bit where the, 
the daughter has the golf club. Uh, I think the actress is Sh- Shahadi Wright Joseph. She's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, she she hits one of the twins with the yeah. golf club. Yeah. Um, and and then she, she keeps does like a, going for what, it. Well, she she keeps going for it, but then afterwards she like looks at the the brother, and then she does like a little cool like shake of her arm, like wow, like I can't believe I just did yeah, that. Yeah. And it's and it's all all moments like that which turn a good film into a great film. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I, Jordan Peele is a real real talent in terms of casting, everything, yeah. <laughs> literally everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean. We, his next project is going to be uh, well. He would have already wrapped it. The Twilight Zone. Is ready oh yes, to go, I'm really it? excited about yeah, that. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. Um, I'd love to see that. He's a perfect pick, isn't he? Because yeah. also, I, I, you, something that I don't I haven't really seen acknowledged is that a lot of this this film also plays out almost like a zombie invasion film. And yet, it's, oh, yeah. you know, just in terms of the way they're isolated as a family, they don't know what's going on. They don't know how many of these people they're going to mm. face. It, a lot of the like basic plot elements are there of like a zombie film, and yet it's just changed beyond recognition into mm. something so unique and original. Absolutely. Um, so I, I, I really, he clearly has such a great grasp on horror and how to make it meaningful and relevant and sort of unique and fresh. And I, I think w- what I love so much about him as well is that the, he's. I love him. I, love him. <laughs> I, I, oh, I, I do. Um, he, he's clearly inspired by some of the really great kind of conceptual horror films of the 70s and 80s, like A Nightmare on Elm Street, well, Step for Wives. Like a Hitchcockian film. Oh, film yeah. Film. Well, he, yeah. Basically, he his ideas are very tethered with some of the best like mm. American horror films in history. The thing is, when you go back and watch some of them, you can enjoy them for the like the the marvelous craft and the the, the ideas that feel really brown, groundbreaking and political. One thing you always have to get over is the fact that the dialogue is is often very bare or mm. in in many cases bad, yeah. um, and the performances are a bit dodgy. And he's now doing these similarly ambitious concepts. But with fantastic actors and a really yeah. solid script with loads of setup and payoff, and it's just, it's, it's like they're made for me. <laughs> it's I just want him to keep making films. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I did have some, you know, there are a few things that I, I, I thought were flaws. Like I didn't think it was perfect, but I, I, I just didn't care whilst I was watching yeah. it. It was the shining light of these three films. So oh, sure. by by quite some yeah. distance. I uh, just just before we uh, we move on to our. The um, the, the ma- piece the, de resistance, the, the, the elephant of the hour. <laughs> yes, um, the elephant in the room. Hey. Um, um, yeah, kudos to the soundtrack as well. For yes, us. I was going to say that the, the variations. On, I got five on it. Was fantastic. Yeah, the yeah. weird ballet version. That that moment, I I think I <laughs> weed a bit and clapped myself when she started like doing you her weed. Clapped yourself. Like, clapped to myself. Clapped to myself. Oh to no, myself. I'm clapping myself again. <laughs> well done for seeing this film and being you, Jill. Um, yeah, that just the score in general. I absolutely love. It. Yeah, um, really weird oh, and wonderful. clashing and odd. And um, if you haven't seen us, well, we've done a spoiler review. Um, I hope you liked us as much as we did. Yeah, we do like us, don't we? <laughs> One Direction. I think this is you, us. The, the best, uh, the best us-related joke was that you sent me a message saying Pete Falconer is going to introduce us at the Watershed. And I was like, <laughs> "What are we that famous already? Like, well, why is this happening? <laughs> not the film. What did we do? We're not, we're not that self-important, <laughs> Oliver. Stop thinking about us." Um, 